All right, and good afternoon, everybody. It's been Ventures here in Dade City at the Pioneer Florida Museum and Village. And we are going to go ahead and go right away. Today is the Florida History Turn of the Century Day here at the Florida Museum, at the Florida Pioneer Florida Museum. And so uh, we're going to go, go ahead and head on in and take a look around and see what the uh, offers are for today. So let's go ahead and get right in, in here. All right, so I've got the last remaining, which is the weapon de demonstration down at the battlefield. We are gonna head down there right now and take a look at that. And then we'll have our last session by author Patsy West, a 20th century seminal history in the main building. Let's go ahead and and there's one of the soldiers right there. We're about to go down here to the battlefield. So I guess here. And then Rebel's fleet got caught in a hurricane, sending most of their ships aground and wrecked uh, south down the Atlantic coast of Florida. I guess, right. Uh, what ensued from there is kind of a cat and mouse game uh, as Menendez's men here. went in hunt of the uh, shipwrecked French Corsairs. Uh, I guess we'll sit right French here. Corsairs, this is uh, where the battle is going to take place. Spanish and the English uh, uh, they the wars on the North American continent. So you're going to see a lot of weapons today uh, that we're going to yeah. use at that time. Right. Uh, now, what you have to remember here, and, and also help visualize, <laughs> is that these pikes would have been 12 to 16 feet long. Uh, what you're looking at now are called demi-pikes, and they're much more functional and practical uh, from an electric demonstration standpoint. Now, that halberd can be a really fierce weapon, and you can see it not only has an attacking weapon on one end, it has a beautiful Spanish. Spanish army demonstration coming down to the battlefield. Halberds were oftentimes used for castle guard and were one of the more ferocious pikes that were used, types of pikes that were used. One of the other and one of the more devastating weapons that the Europeans brought to North America was the use of firearms. Uh, nice. We're seeing demonstrated right now is called a matchlock. Uh, it was kind of a second generation of uh, what was originally called an archivist. It was some of the first firearms ever invented. Now the way the matchlock works is very much like a flintlock or, or a percussion cap musket. It's a muzzle loader, as in you pour the powder and, and the lead ball it's just down powder. the barrel. You would draw the rammer, just as you see the volunteer demonstrating now. You're going to depress all of that down to the bottom of the barrel. It return the rammer, and the ignition stand ignites the powder into the pan, and then that button has, goes ahead and ignites the powder into the barrel, and all the business comes out the front end. This was a particularly devastating weapon, more on a psychological uh, sense than an actual sense, because two twice as long as the ones they're carrying down there. So you see the recruits going through a different exercises, and, this is actually a, a very, very detailed set of drills, uh, pike drills, and you can note, you'll notice that they are advancing now. The idea was to form a tight formation so that whether a cavalry charge or an infantry charge, uh, the only thing that they came up against was the pointy metal. And again, you, you, have, you have the gentleman behind, he's kind of giving them cues and orders as far as how they move. Now, what do you, what do you want to visualize here? We have just four volunteers demonstrating the pike drill. What do you want to imagine? There's 36 of them, all in a densely packed square, advancing in this formation. Now, the, the idea of the pike is very, very old. Uh, uh, you know, the Spartan Phalanx was famous for this. Uh, but they, you know, obviously, the, a sharp has been around for many, many centuries. Uh, but the Spanish, in 700 years of liberating the Iberian continent from Moorish influence, Spanish soldiers became very, very adept at the art of war. 
The combined arms uh, made them some of the most fierce warriors on the planet at that time. Now the combined arms strategy was one that was forged in combat over centuries. So that not only would you have a very densely packed pike formation, but on the flanks of the pike formation, you would have swordsmen uh, and shields. Did you shoot at us? battle demonstration got here just in time also now we're just going to kind of walk around and see the different campsites you can see one behind me here this would be like a spanish uh campsite where they would camp out of spanish during the um spanish american war that happened down here in florida in um dade city just outside of ocala we're not very far away we're about an um, hour from Ocala right now. And so um, we're going to go ahead and take a look around as uh, Nebraska is ahead of Ohio State 15 to 14. They just scored a touchdown 16 14. But we're going ahead and just I'm looking around, I'm taking a look around as they're the different sides and what all they had for armory. As you can see, this is some of the armory that the Spanish would wear when going out to fight in the battle for Ocala and Dade City. It almost looks like a javelin. Do you what? think a javelin, like oh. a javelin, that you throw a real long pole with the point at, at the end? Like the pikeman down there. Okay. Yes, yes. See, this goes on here. This is a later model. And like a soccer <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, much later. And that lock ring locks it on. There we go. And that's the bayonet. That's a good question. It's on a bayonet. Sam, pull still a minute. Put it back on. Please. See what it is. Thank you. Militia. Militia would have to bring everything themselves. Oh, yeah. You know, an army, you always have wagons. Yeah. Militia wouldn't have that. They'd have to move out on their own. Oh, wow. See, in Florida, after the Second Seminole War, yeah. they passed the, uh, it was called the Armed Occupation Act. Okay. okay. What they did is they asked anybody who wanted to come to Florida, any man, come to Florida, we'll give you 160 acres of ground. So people came down, there were three criteria. You had to build a house in one year. You had to cultivate five acres over five years. Okay. But you had to be immediately available for Florida militia. Because after the war, the army began to withdraw. Uh-huh. So if the Seminoles uprose or attacked any of your neighbors, uh, you would have to be the only defense available. So the people had to form a militia.
to oh. fight the Indians. Oh, okay. You had to be willing to do that or you couldn't come down. Or you couldn't be in Florida, you couldn't live here. Yeah, no. Wow. All right. And so I guess that's just like a satchel? That's well, it's, a cat, it's a cartridge box. Cartridge, okay. This is where you'd hold ammunition. Okay, yeah, for the Union soldier. Well, this is actually U.S. This oh, is before the... Civil War. Oh, okay. This is okay. 1842. 1842, yeah. And, uh, that's right, it's, yeah. It was right before the Civil War, because 1861 yeah. was when it started. Yeah. Yes, got it. So there we go. And I, got, I really like, like the musket. You can pick it up. It weighs about 10 pounds. Dang. You know, that's how big this thing was. So how would you carry it? So we're at the Overstreet house. Decorated. Chapter daughter. American Revolution. Date City, Zephyr Hills, and Plant City. This is her. It's here you can see kind of like the dining, dining living area. You got a Bible on the front table on the table there with the reading glasses. Got the little doll there in the corner of the bed. Uh, wow, sofa. Got a couple of chairs, of course. Got the uh, the fire fireball. Oh, chimney, fire, fireplace. Nice chandelier. Of course, over here you got the piano, grand piano, oil lamps. Away, buddy. I'm just getting little, some stuff. Little train right there. Walk through here and go through each eye. Uh, here's the kitchen. And the light just flicked on. All right. So this is the kitchen. You got some homemade stale bread. Homemade bread there with some cup of tea. Uh, cups on the table. Nice dining set. Of course, that's wall art. Wall art. Panel. Window panels. This is the kitchen. Dining, dining room really. This is more the dining room. Kitchen be over on this side, over here. And of course, you see. Oh, it's okay. Porch. Yeah, here's the street. The kitchen. Here is the kitchen. So you got the water basin there, wash tubs. You got cooking. You got some eggs on the table there. On the counter, you got the stove. Cast iron skillets, teapots, and even some more. That looks just gross. Hard biscuits, oranges for breakfast. You got some breakfast. Ceiling there is very much alive and well. Of course the windows. You got the cabinets. Got different jams and jellies over on the kitchen counter by the sink. And candle lit. New stairs at own risk. Original to the house and are steep and narrow. Be cautious. So the stairs. Steep and narrow. Here, they have a bedroom. Kids' room. One of the kids' bedrooms. Got a bunch of dolls here. So I've got some building blocks. Big old doll right there on the floor. Picture of cats. Here you got, believed to be the parents' bedroom. It's like a, uh, I guess if you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you just pop, uh, pop a squat right on the chair. Uh, open the lid on top and go to, and do your business. And got the baby in the crib. Probably this definitely is the parent's bedroom where the mother and father sleep. Of course, we got the Sewing kits, sewing clothes, chairs here. Nice. 
This one here is the, uh, uh, looks like the bedroom, another bedroom. They got a little, little stove heater for the winter, even though it might not need it as much. Also got a bed underneath, uh, or to keep luggage under the bed for people to stay the night and travelers. We got a little wash basin here and wash hands. You got big bay, got a sewing wheel. It is hot up here. Nice little top hat. Nice top hat. And shoe shiner uh drawer station. Let's head back downstairs. Go to the next exhibit. Alright, so we got all of our Still, uh, all of our people still looking, and still some people dressed out there. Eh? All right, so let's take a look around. We're gonna go up here to this gentleman who's discussing some of the artifacts from the. Uh, from the Seminoles, a little bit of Seminole history. Let's go ahead and head up. Just like my mom, you know, you ever heard where we say things like, oh, they talk to you? Well, my mom, they didn't talk to us. They just showed us some things. When we saw a red bird, that meant something good. It was a good omen. I suppose the thing about the owl, uh, a lot of native uh, cultures don't look upon the owl as a very uh, positive uh, uh, bird. It's probably one of those that is a very uh, uh, negative connotation to that particular uh, type of bird. So. Uh, Owls are not seen as a very uh, positive, a very good omen in Native American folks. Cook these nice meals. Boy, I just, I had it good growing up. Yeah. The food was better back then uh, than it is today. Uh, nice. But, uh, yeah, this represents the Seminole camp encampments back in the, around the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Four log fire. This is a chiki, lean-to chiki. Very interesting uh, aspects of the culture and survival. It's all about survival. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what it was. I mean, with the Seminoles and and then eventually uh, attacking and being attacked and yeah. driven out yeah. from the yeah. state, it's like you're in survival mode every day. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, Where are you from? I'm from, well, I'm originally from... Um, all right, so talking to a nice gentleman over at the Seminole uh, camp and a lot of Florida history uh, front with the Seminoles and uh, how they set up base camp here as uh, the turn of the century of the Florida Territory. Now we're going to move on to the Carpenter Blacksmith Shop just next door, but we're going to move on to the Carpenter and see now we can actually go in and take a look around at the Carpenter Shop. What are they doing all this are like in the country so and the have like here and there in the shop. Why you are can you see now, like, some of the stuff that they carve. Carve out of wood. Logs. Um, it's no demonstration, but uh, just a lot of displays and artifacts from wood and different 
wood carvings and carving tools that are used to uh, make to make um, things, make make furniture, household items. Our fan. See all the wood, the dust, shavings all over the, all over the floor. You got over here. Ohio State won. Okay. Ohio State just won. Just got the notification. Twenty-one seventeen. Buckeyes win. We'll take it. But it was a rough one. Of course, morning you got the ships. This train here is carrying a lot of coal and metal scraps. Up to Ocala. So we're making our way back up to the front now as we make our way uh, to the museum part. Back up to the museum part of the exhibits. And then so we can find David. See if he's still here. I'm going to try and still. Hey. Cool. Yeah, a little bit of artifacts here. This didn't work. Yeah. So, so they'll try to take St. Augustine, but completely fail. Like, like they almost they they, get, they come to Florida, but everything falls apart, and they have to go back to Georgia. They're going to try again in 1777. Um, this time they have better command under Colonel Samuel Elbert. Oh, wow. And he actually has a strategy this time. So, but so part of his so his idea was that the militia will go ahead and they will land on Amelia Island. The 3rd and 4th Battalions of the Georgia troops will march overland um, into Florida. And then Samuel Elbert personally, with the 1st and 2nd Georgia, will take the Intracoastal all the way to Amelia Island and everyone rendezvous there so they can push on St. Augustine. However, the militia arrives first. Elbert gets delayed because he's taking the Intracoastal, so it's a big windy what? you know, path, so it takes him extra days. The militia arrives there the third and fourth Georgia actually get lost, and so they just end up walking back. <laughs> the militia ends up getting jumped at Thomas Creek by the British troops, completely taken by surprise. Oh, wow. And then um, that was an easy British victory. Like, I think it was like a five, five, ten minute battle, completely won. What's left of the militia went to Amelia Island, where George Elbert, with the first and second Georgia, finally land and run into them the day after the battle. And they see who's left, and so he gets mad, just burns Amelia Island, and goes. Home. <laughs> all right, so thank you all for joining me here at the Florida Pioneer Florida Museum and Village here in Dade City, Florida, for the uh, Florida Territory event with the 20 turn of the 20th century with the Seminoles and the battle reenactment demonstration. Also, some alligator wrestling, but was not here in time for that. And they also, and then just walked around to the different stations and to talk uh, to the reenactors about, a little bit about, more about Seminole culture and Florida history. And, uh, and a lot of ins and outs, odd, odd things too. But I'm hoping to be back for... Uh, up this way uh, next weekend will be the Battle of Ocala and the Battle of Okawaha
that's what it's called, but it's in Ocala at the Florida Horse Park, and which literally sits between Tampa and Gainesville. Gainesville is about 30, 45 minutes to, uh, from Ocala, and so nevertheless, we will be ready for that next weekend, and also a lot of other events that are coming up, I'm going to try to be a part of, and you guys will be coming along with me. Also, don't forget to drop a like on this video, subscribe to Spin Ventures if you haven't already done that, and ring the bell for notifications. Right now, we are going to head off and get something to eat, also get some gas, I need to fill up my car, and then we'll be making our way to Gainesville So uh, for the evening, and then doing Trunk or Treat tomorrow at Majestic Oaks, and making our way... Um, uh, that way. So, thank you all for joining me, and we will see you all on the next spin. Let's get down the track.